Oh, darn it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to some more... Excuse me. Let's play Underrail. In the last episode, we made it down to the Abyssal Station. Abyssal Station Zero, I suppose, is what this is called. Where we met Todd. Todd is the only survivor, it looks like, still alive down here in Abyssal Station Zero. The son of this family, and married to the daughter of this family. The station apparently consisted of native Lumerians and people from Atlantis as well. A different uh, water area somewhere in North Underrail that was also underwater. These Atlanteans were used to living conditions like this. Underwater, confined, cramped spaces. The Lumerians were not. The Lumerians suffered all sorts of different types of psychological problems trying to live in here when they were evacuated down in here when Biocorp Bio attacked. The Atlanteans who were living here and Lumerians who moved in, they began working together and were placed here, well, placed there, and began working in, like, the research facility here, the R&D dome. But the research facility, th that effort, seemed to have created some division into how things were done. Eventually, everyone who went into the R&D Dome stayed there, until one day, they all left simultaneously. They were not normal upon leaving. They demanded people join them and leave, and so they did. Or rather, pe people who would not leave uh, were killed, and a large battle took place between the people who were in the R&D and the survivors here. The R&D people eventually took all the submarines or whatever means of exit they could from this station and went to the surface. We don't know what happened to them. Oh, I know what happened to them. We'll find out what happened to them very soon. All this was discovered by talking with Todd, and Todd himself has problems. He has multiple personality disorder. He is acting out the roles of his father, his mother, his Fiancé's uh, mother and father as well. Todd is eating from his can. He has had lots of problems in his life. We're not going to read about too many of them, because I went through all the different conversation topics to get Todd's other personalities to convince him to open the door in R&D. But I will summarize what I can. His mother, who we had to convince, was extremely protective of Todd. And we had to convince her that Todd is capable of making decisions on his own and does well when he thinks of this and can do these things without her assistance and or guardianship. For his father, who calls Todd worthless all the time, we had to convince him that Todd actually knows what he is doing in regards to the tools and using them to fix the various subsystems and problems that go wrong here in Abyssal Station Zero. Finally, we had to convince Stig, his fiancé's father, that Todd's health is acceptable and that his problems, and the reason why he, uh, his fertility is so low, we'll get to that in a little bit, is because of the medicine he is on and that it, the new experiences that he might C by opening the gate and being brave will help him face these troubles. Now, we during this these conversations, I was able to convince his father to let him do this by having Todd instruct us of how to use that tool bracer we picked up in this room. To successfully navigate that conversation, you must fail in every way imaginable, to use the tool bracer. Because Todd, acting as his father, will get angry and show you how to use it. But that means that Todd knows how to use it because he's actually the one showing you. The father's personality will then recognize that Todd is doing it and, allow, and realize that Todd is not so useless. He can actually... Uh, and 
well, I don't know what he can do, but it will be enough to convince his father to let Todd go and open the door. For Stig, you have to answer a series of questions about how, what you're planning to do, like why you want Todd to open that door, how would it benefit him, is it okay that he experiencing this, what if something goes wrong? Depending upon how good or bad you did, uh, you'll get a grade, basically. He'll tell you, like, I don't, I disagree entirely with you. Or, I can see some points, but not others. It's basically kind of like, there was a game called Mastermind, where you knew if you were getting one thing, like, you had certain amounts of choices with these crystals, and every time you got, you could figure out eventually, as you guessed the, the answers to the questions, which ones were what colors. It's kind of like that. It's like a, it's like a combo lock. Now, the, the way to solve the father and Stig's puzzles are also online. So you can, someone has a, a post, I think, on the Underrail forums about the, the successful buttons you press to navigate through those conversations, which is, makes it very, very, very quick. And in my case, I've done this already, so I, I feel no remorse or guilt about doing this, because it, it took me a long time to solve this by myself. I also have a video. I could already watch that video and solve this problem, too. Now, the mother for Todd is the most difficult to convince. You kind of have to navigate through all these different conversation topics, which slowly unlock other conversation topics, and will eventually all be brought back to the pictures that we saw on the wall earlier. In fact, you have to click on those pictures at least once in order for you to successfully solve her puzzle. So, basically, you... you ask a question, ask another question, ask another question, and then you get back to the main uh, topic conversation list, and there is something you can say about one of the paintings. Always choose that option if it shows up, and that will make some progress towards getting the mother con uh, convinced that you're doing the right thing. And then a conversation topic that you had used to get you to that painting will vanish from the options you are allowed to talk about. It's the longest one to do, and it's actually the reason why I decided to cut all this out, because we would have been reading for like 35 minutes just of the mother's conversation topics. It's interesting, but if you want to watch it, I recommend, I'll try to remember to put a link down here, but I can't promise I'll remember, to how Garrett solved these uh, these questions. This way you can read all of it, because I don't want to, I don't want to read, <laughs> I don't want to read and go through the puzzles for like an hour. All right, so uh, as you can see, I decided that, okay, no one really cared what I was going to do. I got no comments about mm, drag him to, drag him to the door, intimidate him to make him open the gate. No one seemed to care, so thinking about it, I've, I'm like, okay, Gabriel is not an evil person. Realistically, he might grab Todd and force him to the gate and say, open this. But I'll go ahead and solve the puzzle off screen. Not too much work. And now that I've talked for like 10 minutes about this, I'd like to speak to your parents and your parents-in-law again. He closes his eyes. Ah, welcome back, Gabriel. About Todd. Can you let Todd unlock the gate to R&D for me? I suppose we can trust him to unlock it. But what if, what if, oh, uh, well, all right, it can't be that bad. You've convinced me freedom of movement and action would benefit his health. And my husband convinced me. Right, the wife of Stig, the father, so this is the mother and father of the fiance. Uh, she, you know, there's no convincing you needed to her. You just need to talk with her once and then she'll go along, uh, She'll go along with whatever her fa uh, her husband says. As for his fiance, you don't get the option to talk to her at all. And I believe she is dead. Long, long dead. Somewhere. What you see in Todd's face seems to represent everyone looking at each other. One by one, they nod. And then... Yes, yes. You have our permission to take the boy to the gate. But remember what we talked about, Gabriel. I will do so right away. Todd, are you in there somewhere? He closes his eyes and reopens them after a few moments. Uh, me? Todd, by the way, as you solve each of these family members' uh, puzzles, 
you hear how he, what he thinks about that parent and why he is kind of acting the way he is for that parent. It makes him, it makes me feel sorry for Todd. It really does. He's lived here, he's had a rough time of it all down here alone. And this apparently is his mind's way of dealing with the situation. I mention that because while we've talked to him and you got a general idea about who he is and, and so on from the last video, I want to stress that I will try to save Todd if things go bad. I need you to unlock the gate to the R&D dome for me. I can't go there. I told you. I talked to your parents. They'll allow it. They do? He pauses, confused. Yes, they... They do. Follow me. Todd brings his right hand near the gate control screen. Red light turns green, and the gate opens. He pauses, almost as if he wishes to turn away and leave, but instead speaks with a new voice, not dissimilar to his usual tone, tenor. Todd? He looks around. Senya? Seneva? Can you hear me, Todd? Yes, I'm helping Gabriel. And you... Are you feeling well? How's our baby boy doing? Todd. What's the matter, Senya? How's our boy? Don't you... Don't you know what I'm talking about? It took us so long, Senya, but we finally did it. You gave me a boy. Her eyes fill with tears. Todd, I'm dead. Frey is dead. We did not survive the birth. My parents, your parents, everyone. You don't know whose teary eyes you're staring into. I forgot about this. But after a while, it doesn't seem to matter. You were waiting for me. To make you happy, Senya. For so long. You can't be... You are. And I'm all alone. He gives you a sad and unmistakably more mature look. Then he turns around and jogs away. Oh my god, it's so fucking sad. <laughs> oh. 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 Oh, man. Okay. Oh, I'm glad we didn't insult him or drag him here. Holy crap, that's so sad. Okay, what else is there? So, uh, before we go into this place, uh, the Necron Lord, whose name I cannot pronounce, mentioned that there is an item we could have gotten to help us with the room we are about to enter, or the area we're about to go in. I felt it was more thematic for us not to have it. I felt like we were under pressure to get here and get this task done due to the native's con uh, consistent and continuing attacks on the Aegis Incorporated. But what we're about to do, there is something very nice you can get, a very powerful item that will be into one of your, they can put into one of your quick slots. I'm not going to talk more about it until after we're done, but I wanted to mention that it is, there is an item that can help you with the area we're about to walk in. What I pl it's going to be very tricky for us because we don't have that item, but I think we'll be okay. Let's get going. Actually, we won't be okay, but we're going to do with this anyway, I suppose is a better way to phrase this. Special lab, residential, one, docking, residential, two, power. Special lab is to the left, everything else is to the right. When I, hmm, when I was really young, my parents worked at a place called AT&T Bell Laboratories at the Homedale Research Park. It was an amazing structure, and to this day, I still remember what it looked like on the outside and the inside. At the very bottom of the structure, I think the, the basement level, it looked very similar to the labs in Half-Life, and I seem to remember that there were those 
lines on the walls guiding you to different areas of research and or arrows pointing the way. That's what this sign is doing, trying to guide you to where you need to be in case you walked into the wrong place or this is your first time in here and need to find a particular laboratory. No power. We can't look at the computer terminal from this way. And there still is no power, so we're not opening that door either. Oh, I hope my, my... It sounds really loud in my ears. I hope the music's not too loud. Excellent material for fireproof clothing, as basalt fibers are highly resistant to. Rebars made from these fibers have a much higher strength-to-weight ratio and corrosion resistance. Wool for insulation, filtration, as hydroponic growth medium. Transparent metallic glass, a microalloy comprised of... ...is made through the process of aerodynamic levitation, whereby the materials are suspended in air and melted with lasers. Expensive to produce, otherwise, theoretically, the entire Bristol station could have been constructed from. We'll go ahead and read a little bit of this uh, on screen, everyone. Or rather, uh, uh, on screen. I'm going to read three things from each computer terminal we see. Me? I don't think I do. I do have a crawler poison. You know what? We're gonna take one steel plate and we're gonna make some caltrops. Not every day that I can make one of those on the fly. So, when I did this area with Garrett, I instinctively realized this area is a trap. And I think Gabriel's smart enough to realize the same. So you're going to notice that I'm leaving the doors un uh, open rather than closing them. A symbiotic environment combining conventional aquaculture with hydroponics, making the aquaponics. Fish, crustaceans, mollusk, hydrozone colonies. Biofilters, where nitrification bacteria can convert ammonia into nitrates for plant. So far, just normal research it looks like. of it, and a biohazard suit. This whole body garment protects from most conventional and unconventional biohazards. I don't think we own one of these. We'll take it as a memento for us being down here, but I don't intend to ever wear it. started opening them. Hacking? We have hacking. Yeah. 
storage. Using quality stuff, we don't really need the. We don't, we don't really need that. Sniper rifle, that stuff will help increase its worth dramatically. Some canned food. We don't have any canned food. We should take some meat and eat it. <laughs> Nothing like one hundreds of years old canned meat. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to us. Remember, the acorn is also located somewhere in this facility. Garrett was here, I was unable to... He didn't have any hacking, so I was unable to open any of these doors. There's probably just random loot in these, as opposed to anything really, really impressive. In the final room we will walk into, there is a f there are a few crates or desk drawers which possess high-level weaponry, if I recall correctly. I'm not getting in there. How do I get in that room? Hold on. I'm gonna double all the way back. I want to read what's on the computer. There's a box in that room, too. I didn't even notice the door right there. I guess we'll go this way, and then we'll explore around this passage. Bedsit canisters in the manufacturing dome. Demand for drugs for treating various disorders in the native population, both mental and physical, due to inadaptability to living conditions. Not for the sub-islander population, that is, for us. More meat. Another weird symbol. Oh, I should have read that, what that was. Hold on. We're actually gonna go ahead and do so. I thought that was I thought that was not the only one. A weird but oddly familiar symbol written in red on a piece of electric electronic paper. It's the same symbol we see for the portals. Always take the palm C. Between R&D and the remaining submarines and subspheres. No access to food processing dome. Through Residential 1, the time has come for... For my siblings, who sadly couldn't see the truth. Uh-oh. Doesn't sound much like research now. Just as he expunged the invading submarine. Tons and tons of suited slime in its place, darkening bring a fragment of that which gave us wisdom. Flotsmer's power, infinite. We've seen this language before. That's from the natives. We were told that when the Atlanteans left this place, they were speaking a bastardized version of their original language. Sacrifice of human flesh and bone. 
cut into pieces and arranged according to instructions, while the liver is dipped into the solution. Blood collected in the bowl, mixed with shadow dust and sprinkled across. They ignite the crystal incense to cast shadow light upon. Well... Sounds like heresy's been- Ooh, what the heck? Sounds like heresy's been going on down here. Really, game? Yes, I want to attack the vault- the, the fuse box. That's exactly what I would like to do. Oh, screw you, game. I guess we should take these. They don't weigh anything. Even if it's not super high quality, they'll still be useful. And then we have another battery. Let's go ahead and recharge our hack. Oh, hacksword is recharged. I guess we'll charge our hammer. Now that I've used it on something. Yeah, that sounds quite different than researching about how to make better alloys for clothes construction or fabric. Sounds uh, blood and research that happened on Mars, if I recall Doom Guy correctly, or just Doom in general. Special lab, generator lab. Okay, everyone. Dangerous time now. Don't think we have a 125 hacking. I do not. 120. Looks like this stuff gets to stay there. A shard of some black substance with a cut in it, emitting some sort of energy. If you've ever seen the movie The Dark Crystal, it's a, I believe it's somewhat like that. Garrett did not touch this, and I will not do it with Gabriel either. This is a bridge too far for me to touch. It seems it would be bad, I think, to do so. Inside is a massive, dried-up human brain. There's no power to the organ tank, nor to the computers here. Contain grossly oversized hearts with electrodes, electrodes attached to them. Hello. High quality psionic components. We will take all of you. Meg tracings. Magnetoencephalogram of a certain R. Janssen's brain activity during high frequency shadow wave exposure, as printed at the bottom. Doesn't look healthy one bit. Pacifier. The cumbersome and clunky construction of this psionic headband suggests that it is just an experimental model. It seems that their designers were looking to enhance non-lethal psionic techniques. Looks like a head scanner, or maybe a projector of some kind. No power. Before we turn on the power, let's search the rest of this. Liquid crystal slime. When motionless, the liquid is viscous and sticks to the walls of the container, its sparkling reflections richly colored. But when shaken, the liquid breaks up and turns into mat mat mate dry lumps. It remains so for a few moments, then it resettles and reliquifies. It 
depicts a gigantic serpent devouring a star. Oh, okay. But say it looks like the the glitter glimmer coming out sparks coming out of this. Stop for a second. Welcome, P Bridges. Unable to connect to Asin. Only local data is available. Documents. Documents. Shadow wave psycho projection charts. Shadow wave psycho projection charts. Standard. Shadow wave frequencies. Infra. No perceptible stimulation and no short term effects. Delta. Faint. Distant aureal beat in the range of 5 through 15 beats per minute. No visual stimulation. Theta. Deep stimulation of unconscious cognition, inductive reasoning, memory recollection, creativity association, language, etc. This must be the result from putting people into the scanner, and then, I guess, beaming them with this light. Alpha. Sense of great relaxation and loss of sense of time and spatial awareness. Beta. Lucid auto-visual hallucinations. Gamma. Increased analytic cognitive performance, deductive reason deductive reasoning, complex problem solving, etc. Upsilon. Increased psionic performance across most disciplines. Exhausting for non-psionic subjects. Severe headaches in extreme cases. Frequencies higher than 60 Hz are considered dangerous and should only be used with psionic subjects while exercising extreme caution. Shadow dust in inhalation. So that must have been on normal people, and now is after they've exposed them to some sort of drug that they've created. I'm guessing that that missing slice from the crystal is what they used in ground up in order to create this dust. Infra. Sense of verminacular motion inside head and abdomen. Mild headache and intestinal pain in approximately half the subjects. Delta. Violent pounding in the ears. Sometimes accompanied by hissing, growling, and screaming. No visual stimulation. <laughs> Theta. Creeping terror, distress, coldness. Alpha. Sense of asphyxiation and claustrophobia. Beta. Temporary loss of sight and hearing with the exception of sporadic audiovisual visual visions, most commonly containing flashing pairs of lights, serpentine motion, and indiscernible, discernible echoing sounds. Gamma. Suicidal urges, madness, often leading to cerebral hemorrhaging and death, complete and overwhelming sensory hallucinations. Frequencies higher than 42 Hz will consistently result in death of subjects that have inhaled shadow dust. So they were doing some pretty... Uh, I don't know what the pre... Immoral? Well, it's not immoral. If they're, if they're just studying this stuff, they want to see what happens. And if they had volunteers, though maybe those volunteers were mandatory, or chosen volunteers. Psycho projection images. Dr. Mattel's drawings. The first drawing features a black background with a few white squiggly lines, some thicker, some thinner, nothing more. The second sketch is more elaborate. There are about 20 or so lines horizontally parallel to one another, with some having warm correlation, a coloration, red, orange, yellow, either all the way through or partially until turning white again. They are shaped like sine waves with smooth, constant amplitude, but some waves are only uniform up until they spiral out of order and outside the bounds of the drawing. The third sketch is yet more elaborate. The background is still black, but all the lines are colored without restrictions. Their mutual spatial relationship feels organized in a fully two-dimensional way, while their shapes are more varied in size and proportions, if still rounded for the most part. Simple geometrical shapes like triangles and squares split in half diagonally are also present, as if emerging from some kind of fabric formed by the underlying intertwistment of multicolored lines. Yet the form is purely abstract and doesn't reference anything in, from the real world. The fourth drawing is completely blank. The fifth drawing can easily be mistaken for a long lost work of abstract art. It is fully colored, three-dimensional painting of a warped land or water, or something completely different, with angular shapes of complex geometry placed on it with a great sense of spatial awareness and proportion. The colors are overwhelming, as if the painter was compensating for the lack of vividness or some other inherent property 
and many lines were drawn multiple times with slight deviations in their dimensionality. You get the impression that the image is supposed to represent something. More. But it is difficult for you to discern what. The sixth drawing represents a cold, calculated organization of shapes, void of artistry and human emotion. A technical drawing, in essence. The rounded shapes are predominant, again, as well as a few merged tachytedrians, and colors are uniform in distribution and saturation. This is the first one that features text, formula that seem to describe properties of the drawn reality, and relate them to our own. The seventh drawing is unfinished, being about only one-third done. It is a chaotic amalgamation of all the previous works, containing spirals and triangles and half-written formula. Its incompleteness doesn't have a sense of drawing direction you're familiar with. Instead, there are many holes in the composition. Certain spots just lack color. Whereas some other spots are completely blank, and there's no discernible pattern to any of this. The drawing makes no sense to you. It is also appears to be the last one in the folder. Early Collection This folder contains numerous drawings by various individuals, ranging from simple black and white sketches to colorful portrayals of mind-bending objects, worlds, or purely abstract concepts. Rounded, wave-like, wave -like, or spiraling lines pervade the imagery, and triangles, pyramids, or tetrahedrons, depending on the dimensions featured, are also common motifs. There are a few notable ones. A transparent submarine dripping with black slimy mass, beams of light illuminated from dark below. A human figure cutting the monolith depicted as being laid down horizontally on the floor. There was black smoke rising from it and filling the room before falling back down as specks of dust. Some strange flying machine with large wings speeding through fog. Its dimensions and other properties are written next to it. A man and a woman with their hands reaching up. Tentacles emerge from below and hold them by their legs. Anatomy of a woman with some unknown markings on her vital organs. Her skin is colored green. Contemporary Collection This folder contains numerous drawings by various individuals, most of them disturbing in form and content. They feature twisted perspectives, strong colors that bleed into one another, serpents and other sinister-looking creatures devouring or simply slaughtering humanoid beings, as well as creatures of other kinds. Some of these drawings contain formulas, occult rather than scientific, regarding things done to flesh that is often featured next to the inscriptions, drawn in one way or the other. Some of them more notable than others. Humanoid reptilians driving spears to a hairy, muscular, four-legged creature. They in the middle of an endless pool of blood. A serpent constricting various objects, people, machines, cities, stars, and things greater, often titled as Sormer or Flotsorm or most commonly, Flotsormir. A vortex of some kind, dark-centered and surrounded by people both alive and dead. All of the living ones are bowing deeply, but the one who's sprinkling some kind of black dust all over it. The dead are never whole. Neuron mapping set. The dark screen slowly turns purple. Colorful and detailed spiraling shapes of mathematical perfection begin to appear in the middle of the screen, becoming more and more concentrated in the very center until a symmetrical image finally gains form. The shapes repeat in different configurations and are self-similar, composed of smaller, identical, or almost identical shapes to itself, diminishing its scale to apparent infinity. The text underneath the image indicates that the image is being rendered in real time from some kind of mathematical function and you are given the option to zoom further in. No, I'm not going to. That way lies chaos. I do not desire. I do not desire to know if it, I don't. An open mind is like a fortress with its doors, with its gates open and its, its doors open and its gates unbarred. Was that, was that the saying? We're not gonna look any, into that one anymore. The screen displays an image of a dissected man. His body is twisted and atrophied, and certain patches of his skin feature reptilian scales. Shadow waves on living tissue. Affects DNA replication. Dust into the bloodstream, which will accelerate the process and cause... Biomolecules unknown. Sounds like they're doing all sorts of horrible things. Hello, bullets. I'll take you because you're worth money. Or 
bullets are worth the money. Gate control. It's some kind of crudely constructed scanner. You can't deduce much from, much from its appearance. Another computer. Documents. Shadowlith Archive. This is a collection of collaborative scientific notes, reports, and papers on Shadowlith recovered following Shadow Emission LEAD-129, which wiped out most of the data in the Special Laboratory database. The collection is incomplete and provides limited corporeal insight into the most basic interactions between Shadowlith and our reality. It should only serve for archival purposes. Discovery The Black Monolith was first uncovered at the Abyssal Ev Excavation Site 6, exact year and date unknown, closest estimate between LEBD 20 and 30, several years after the construction of Abyssal Station 0. The monolith is a 3 meter tall, deep black structure in the shape of a hexagonal prism augmented with pyramid pyramidal? pyramidal frustrums at its top and bottom. It is composed of a material so dense it required four heavy sublifters to bring it to the station. At 108 tons, its density was calculated to be 30.016 grams per centimeters cubed. Transporting it from the manufacturing dome required reinforcing the floor with RG panels and using super lubricant mats to eliminate friction when pushed by strongmen. Not of this world at all. Interesting. Composition test, number 142 and 143. The test was performed after an upgrade to the Nuclear Magnetic Renaissance Spectroscope module in the hopes that it will finally allow us to determine the molecular structure of the Black Monolith after numerous failed attempts. To our dismay, but sadly consistent with all our previous tests, this one too gave us no results. The Black Monolith is impenetrable to all of our instruments and impervious to all tools which we have tried to obtain samples. In agreement with Dr. Morrison, we are ceasing all attempts at further testing the monolith's physical properties until means to obtain samples are provided. We will instead focus all our research on the Shadow Waves. You know, I didn't read about the Shadow Waves with Garrett and the other computer. I came right over here instead. I don't think I even noticed the other computer. Well, show me about Shadow Waves. A Shadow Wave is a transverse wave radiated by the Black Monolith, which, during its first half period, exhibits measurable physical interactions, positive excency, but no measurable interactions during its second half period, negative excency. In normal conditions, the change between positive and negative excency occurs at frequencies of 0.2 Hz, meaning that the wave completes one full cycle in 0.4 Hz, with an average wavelength of 16 microns. Uh, sorry, about 16 microns. Uh, this means about, by the way, that little swiggle, I think. The points where excency states come to an end are called shadow wave excency limits, or more specifically, negative and positive excency limits for each of the respective states of the interaction. The extent to which the shadow waves interact with material reality is not yet known, but so far we've measured the more obvious electromagnetic interactions, effects on shadow waves on electromagnetic fields by Dr. E. Herman Sigmarison. Some weak nuclear interactions, reactive decay at shadow wave excency limits, Dr. Tarbin Vorgier, and some strong nuclear interactions, quark cryodynamic permutations at shadow wave excency limits, Dr. Stor Oivinder. A unaccounted for increases and decreases of mass at excency limits have also been measured, but due to its inconsistent manifestation and magnitude, we've yet to draw solid conclusions with respect to gravitational effects of the wave. Most of these permutations and otherwise unexplained phenomena occurred near or at excency limits, whereas during positive excency, the shadow wave carries energy in the form of a regular electromagnetic wave, starting at the negative and ending at the positive excency limit of that period. In a somewhat predictable fashion, depending on properties measured. How the energy is carried from positive and negative excency limits, for all sorts of purposes, how the wave comes into existence again, and why and how these limits, which can be represented as fields causing these interactions, manifest in space is yet unknown. What is clear is that changes in this electromagnetic component wave during positive excency of the shadow wave is conserved throughout its negative excency, meaning that it is without a doubt the same wave which alternates between affecting and not affecting physical reality, as all of our research suggests. 
in quite possibly all of its fundamental aspects. The electromagnetic wave, which we've studied the most of all interactions, exhibits an unusual kind of elliptical polarization defied by Holdenstein's disjoint function. Informally, it has been dubbed the serpentine polarization, as this graph represents bears the likeness of a snake spiraling through space. All attempts at polarizing the wave in any way have proven unsuccessful, as the wave will be repolarized as soon as the shadow wave enters its negative excency, meaning that, after passing negative excency limit, the EM wave will again have serpentine polarization. Looks like they were trying to manipulate it as well. So far, we've determined that shadow wave can be partially manipulated through changes in the electromagnetic field during positive excency. This means that by giving the wave more energy at appropriate excency limits, we can, for instance, change its frequency in a manner that is consistent with our understanding of the laws of reality. However, this also produces amplified and so far unpredictable quantum effects at excency limits, both positive and negative, depending upon how the wave can be manipulated and by the medium through which it passes. The shadow waves can be directed through space by guiding them into Orion tubes, uh, Orion tubes with a massive magnetic field shaper at the base of the monolith. In these tubes, we can shoot photons at specific intervals, aiming for either negative or positive excency limits, so that we may study the resulting quantum interactions. The consistency of Henlein's law in electron-positron annihilation near negative excency limits by Dr. E. Herman Sigmarsson. The process can be dangerous if too much energy is introduced, which has resulted in two accidents already, but controlled wave manipulation at positive excency limits will create relatively stable changes in the wave. What quantum interactions occur at negative excency limit, like the creation of new particles, actual and not virtual, is currently beyond the scope of our understanding. So they're doing science and manipulation of something they don't fully understand. Well, I guess that's fair. They want to understand it. If they can make it do something that they're familiar with and or have formula or theories about, they might be able to begin explaining things and despite have revealed all sorts of new research. It looks like though, based on inhaling the dust, that it has lots of negative effects, in particular that it seems to come from some other negative dimension. Like demons and what have you will possess you, or you see such horrific nightmares upon inhaling it. Object negation experiment number five. This experiment was conducted to test a hypothesized complete negation of objects from reality with phased shadow wave beam technology. The object used in this experiment is a standard sized pseudo brass cup suspended in a MO5 testing sphere. By channeling the shadow wave through two 5.3 meter long Orion tubes and introducing increasing star amounts of energy at the every positive ecstasy limit, we are able to achieve the desired frequency of 67.5 Hz for both waves. One wave is then continuously phase shifted in the range of about 175 to 185 degrees, while the phased shadow lift wave beam is being focused on the cup. After the darkening effect, double star, has achieved, another energy surge is needed to completely negate the cup from existence, a process which occurred in less than 0.15 seconds. The experiment, besides proving the negation hypothesis, also proves Boughton's principle that strong chemical bonds will ensure the whole objects will be affected. Star, using Sigmundson's Renaissance function. Star Star, Shadow photons and the darkening effect. Dr. E. Herman Sagmarsson. So they're just quoting where, um, what they used to get that effect and why they were using it. In conclusion, the fifth test was a complete success. The only losses being the two Orion tube and one MO5 sphere. However, those could hardly be called losses, not because of relatively small cost of the equipment, but more so due to the fact that changes in their chemical structure and the formation of these unknown liquid crystal com compounds will provide our team with new study material. Oh! So they they got rid of the cup, the tubes they used to, sh to, use to aim and utilize the beam, and the sphere the cup was contained in, but they gained some sort of liquid crystal in return and began studying that. Anamorphic disk. Today we received something called an anamorphic disk. It is supposedly capable of cutting the black monolith. It came in an external shipment, the details of which are oddly kept away from all of us, lowly engineers. 
At first glance, it is a rather unimpressive rubbery disc, 20 centimeters in diameter and 1 centimeter thick, gray in color, and of rough texture, made of some unknown synthetic material that we were explicitly instructed not to scan and to keep in cryo except during use. This thing is something no sane person would ever see as a cutting tool, let alone something that could damage an object as impervious as the Black Monolith. However, after doing some testing at the shop, we now view the amorphic disc in a completely different light. The disc arrived with a Saturn SG-88M, large diameter grinder, on whose end it is to be attached, which frankly gives it a comically disappropriated appearance. Speaking of comical, are we really expected to believe that such a primitive tool as a mechanical grinder with a rubber gasket at its end will achieve what the most technologically advanced lasers and plasma cutters at disposal can't? These thoughts went through all our minds, and then we fired the thing up. Within the span of a second, the disc flattened, while tripling in diameter, its gray color becoming much lighter in the shade. In this state, the disc could cut anything we tested it on, pseudobrass, steel, all the way to stronger alloys and minerals, even to G5 rated diamond, and did so with little resistance. So I'm imagining a piece of putty, everyone. Or rather, not, not putty, but like, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of flat, looks like a disc, and when they spin it, it elongates into something that looks like a, a sword or, a, or a, a beam, as it were. And while in this, like while, while spinning on the edge of this, they can then use it to actually slice things. Will it cut the monolith? That would be its ultimate test. We were instructed to modify a strawman to use the grinder and ensure that it's capable of performing the cut, taking all the potential variables into account. No idea how they came up with those, but what do I know? Just an engineer. Hopefully the cut will be performed tomorrow, after which I will file another report. And that was the last thing they had. All, all of these pieces of equipment we're definitely taking. They don't weigh much of anything. That was one pound. Okay, I'm going belt in now. Take you. Looking on weight. Carry a hand a little bit more. Weaponry, everyone. Okay, so now is when I need to start deciding what I'm keeping and what I'm not. So, I guess we won't keep the biohazard suit. I have a place or two where I know this will be useful for us in the future, though. I guess I could take it. Darn me carrying around that armor. What else do you, what else do you simply not need? So we don't need MK2 grenades. We have MK3s, realistically. So we'll drop... How much do these, do these weigh? Only one pound. Seven pounds for the Caltrop poisons, Tim. You don't really need them. You don't really need them. Is all this way because these w these are worth quite a bit more than the ammo is. We want every single laser weapon that they have. Shock serrated tongues and steel sh knife. Oh wait, right, it doesn't matter. Our, our weapons are significantly better, but we'll still take it. A shotgun is worth a pretty penny. We'll take that as well. We could take and break all these down for components. But I don't think I need the repair kits that badly. The strongman hand, strongman head, has got burn marks that precipitate from the neck and spiral towards the top of the head. They emit the faint purple glow. Looks like the shadow lift lashed out at this when it went to cut the the lift. Look what it is as well, everyone. The acorn. So, this is it. I have a little bit of space left over. I guess we will take back our... Do I really want... Yeah, I'll, I'll do this. I'll take all the ammo back. Okay, that's good enough. Nine pounds left over in case we absolutely need something else on our, on our trip out. Acorn. 
Missile Station Zero. Uh oh. Oh, that's shot. This seems to have powered on the bottom of this. And we have something here now that's attacking us. We are going to consume a jumping bean. Notice as well what has happened outside. We no longer see the ocean. And we have these strange spherical shapes everywhere within the station now. Why can't I move? Oh, did the game... Oh, come on. All right. We have to redo it. That sucks. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that really sucked. That's a shame. Come on, game. Screw you. All right. So, we take back all our bullets. Take back that as well. Do this again. Really quick, did that, when did that shut? Okay, so it's still open at the moment, but the moment we take the acorn, this thing will have been charged enough by what we turned on, and we can't turn it off, to begin doing... Oh, hold on, our food expired. I didn't think we were down here that, that, that long. That doesn't matter. Which we need to get the hell out of this place. So that thing that attacked us last time and didn't quite reach us this time, they are immune to everything you try to throw at them. Nothing can hurt them. They are, again, invulnerable to everything. We need to get the hell out of here. As you can see, they're spawning. Void Rot. This character suffers two energy damage every turn. Tim, where are you going? That door's shut. That that area's shut as well. Let's have another jumping beam. There's nothing up there but the labs. We saw something sparkle here, so there's another, uh, probably one spawn in that direction. We're making great time if uh, we, we were able to leave combat. Something spawned behind us. You'll note that this gate control, however, isn't powered.
you also know we cannot shut the gate. It'll only be a matter of time before they pour into this area. We need to find Todd and get out of get the hell out of here. All the doors are open. You also know we don't hear them. Fuse box, you worried me for a little bit there. I wasn't expecting to see anything. Initiative boost still in effect. Nothing. Todd is not here. Or maybe he's sleeping somewhere, but we don't have I guess we don't have time. Don't worry everyone. He's he's not in this area any longer. Let's get out of here. A pair of eyes stare at you, tinted with a fearful determination. G gabriel Todd! What are you doing here? He gathers his courage. I want to go with you. Welcome aboard. He nods with a slight smile. Don't be afraid. Time to surface. Navigation, course. Uh, we can't enter anything. So I'm going to assume that it's set to go back up to where we first entered. Nav, um, main controls, surface. Verifying coordinates. Done. Performing thruster capability test. Passed. Pinging sub nav units. Two units responded. Obtaining gyro compress information. Done. Plotting course. Done. Vessel is ready to surface. We're... We're moving! He stares outside. Why does no questions? Breathing speeds up. But he closes his eyes and calms down. Good. Dealing with anxiety is very difficult. There should be a beacon here, but everything's dark. There's a lot of dust particles in the water, though. Uh-oh. Look, what was... How much are we? We're almost there. Is this the surface? It is. Now, about you. Me? This world is dangerous, and will swallow you in seconds. 
You can't take care of yourself. But I can't take care of you either, due to the nature of my life. I'll find someone who will, though. You stay here, and I'll be back as soon as I find you a new home. He smiles. Thank you, Gabriel. I'll stay here. I'll be good. I won't touch anything. Good. I'll be back. Okay, everyone, that's going to wrap it up for this session. Thank you guys for watching. So, what's the plan now? Well, we have several things we can do. So far, I don't think anyone has mentioned what to do with the acorn. I've hinted originally that we can sell it to different people, and we can. I didn't realize this was something that we could do with Garrett. We can turn it into Aegis Incorporated, which might make sense for Gabriel to do, being that he's worked with them. We can give it to the Protectorate, in the belief that we will help them. Though I don't know how Gabriel feels about working for the Protectorate, after seeing how they'll disregard their... subordinates... complaints, as it were. We can bring it to Tanner, to help Southgate Station. There may be other people we can give it to as well, or we can just hold on to it. Let me know, and we'll see to it. If I don't get an answer, I will probably turn it into Aegis Incorporated, similar to what I did with Garrett. As for Todd, we can also bring let the Aegis Incorporated people know that he exists and turn him over to them to help take care of him. There may be other people we could convince to take Todd in, however. Two enter my mind. The Ferrymen might take him in. The Dude might take him in also. I'm not sure about that, but he might. Let me know who you think we should have Todd go with, and we'll also see about doing that. In any case, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.